This webinar was part of the International Association for the Study of the Commons World Commons Week. Are you interested in engaging with other common scholars and practitioners around the world? Become an IASC member. Uh, that guide the management of an entity. What are the implications of, of the Arctic as a commons for governance? And along the way, uh, you'll see, uh, some of you, of course, know this intimately and live it, the actual and potential degradation of the Arctic. Uh, evaluate uh, the Arctic case along criteria linked to successful commons governance and present some specific policy changes that evolve from cooperative strategies. And then I add something that I've been working on with colleagues for a few years, uh, the coercion part of commons thinking. Uh, and uh, talk about uh, adversarial approaches to addressing challenges of Arctic environmental degradation. I very much look to your contributions on the need for and the types of change of government. Next slide, please. My work uh, on the Arctic as a commons is a small part of my larger work and our, our, our larger work at the University of California, Irvine, about protecting the Arctic. Who owns it? Who will protect it? Who will govern it? Who governs it now? How? But specifically, <clears throat> for today, does commons thinking add value to the exploration of how to protect uh, the Arctic? The UC Irvine focus has been on uh, bringing together experts addressing the overall environmental governance structure of the Arctic in, present, in, in its present form, looking at specific strategies that have been suggested to address um, Arctic governance, environmental governance, including a program on ecosystems-based management. And then another program that some people would conceptualize as the other end of the continuum on legal strategies, uh, litigation and petition, adversarial strategies for addressing environmental governance of the Arctic. Next slide, please. I'll move through a handful of slides fairly quickly uh, to give those of you who don't live in the Arctic or haven't followed what is happening in the Arctic, uh, don't have a sense of what we're talking about, to give you some pretty pictures of the Arctic. Uh, what is the Arctic? The Arctic has many different faces, uh, and it has many different environments. Next slide, please, number six, I believe. Here's a picture of an industrial part of the Arctic in Russia. Next slide. Here is the gigantic largest island in the world, Greenland, uh, linked still to Denmark in some ways, unpopulated, beautiful, melting. Next slide. Another Arctic state, Tromsø. Beautiful picture of this cosmopolitan city. Uh, I was going to say it um, early evening, but depends when you are there. It could be almost any hour of the day. Next slide, number nine. The starkly beautiful landscapes of the Arctic that you see in so many of its um, places. Next slide. The Arctic in places is polluted. 
and that's why we're part of the reason we're thinking of uh, improved governance of the Arctic. The Arctic in next slide, number 11, emerging new activities and emerging forms of governance, uh, in this case, in the territory of Canada and Nunavut. Next slide, number 12, although there are emerging new activities, new economic development, the traditional cultures of the Arctic remain changed in some form, forms, but with fundamentals with regard to subsistence, sustenance still being um, everywhere. Finally, uh, number 13, the Arctic as a developing place. Uh, this uh, being a picture outside of my hotel room in Alaska. The Arctic, next slide 14, is magically remote and magically beautiful in many places. Next slide number 15, it is stark and wonderfully different than some of the developed areas that we spend our days writing about it in. Next slide is slide 16. Those were pictures of the Arctic places some of us have had the great joy of being in, places where some of us live. When we talk about the Arctic, it is not written in, in stone or biblical, what is the Arctic? So some of our uh, background is to, when we, whether or not we're seeing it as a common, uh, defining what we mean by the Arctic. And there is no set consensual uh, definition of what is the Arctic. Many thinkers address it in terms of latitude, 66 degrees 33. Others think about it, no, it doesn't have to fit within uh, north of that latitude. It could, it might be best understood as a place where there are certain temperatures, less than 10 degrees centigrade for, throughout the year. A third approach uh, that I've been introduced to recently, uh, which uh, is interesting because uh, it leaves out one of the Arctic countries that considers itself an Arctic country is that Arctic countries must have indigenous people. And then two other possibilities, uh, its relationship to the tree line above which no trees grow. Uh, and perhaps um, in ascendance, the notion that the Arctic is defined by countries that are institutionally linked as Arctic states. The next slide, 17. The Arctic as a common. Does it possess characteristics of the common? And later in a minute, what are the implications if it does possess those characteristics? Next slide, number 18. This may be I assume not all of you have been up for 24 hours listening to the uh, webinar, and I'm going to assume that some of you were interested in uh, participating because of the topic of the Arctic or the other topics that are covered and maybe did not have uh, any real 
connection with common thinking. So for, for those who do this, uh, please be patient with us. Just a quick reminder of what we're talking about when we talk, talk about the commons. As I said in the beginning, uh, much of this thinking goes back to now a half century, Garrett Hardin. Uh, also at the University of California when he wrote this, uh, addressing in a very important science article uh, how to address uh, challenges of management of resources. And he talked about this as a tragedy of the commons. He talked about situations in which uh, it is difficult to find any technical solution to the problem. He was very concerned with population at the time, as were many of the early thinkers uh, in environmental uh, analysis and, uh, and planning. The population bomb was uh, written roughly at the same time. The Club of Rome was involved in its uh, high-level conversations about what to do about uh, about a world that was exploding in population and with at least reasonable people could conclude finite resources. And Professor Hardin wrote that in a finite world, the per capita share of goods as population increases must steadily decrease in part. The third bullet here is because um, the utility of my adding a unit to a common, of my putting one more uh, cow into the commons area to graze, the utility to me uh, versus the negative function that was shared by all. So the notion that this analysis would lead to the de degradation of the common and that the freedom of the commons, although it was good to the individual over a period of time, ultimately would bring ruin to everyone. The commons thinking, the next bullet on this slide, refers to both taking things out of the commons and putting things in. He talked about pollution. And in my world of law and policy, he said that the law is always behind the time and requires elaborate, elaborate stitching and fitting to adapt the common situation. He wrote that temperance can be accomplished through law uh, and that the alternative of the commons not being addressed in some way is, as he put it, too horrifying to contemplate. Again, his focus on population, uh, saying that the commons, if justifiable at all, is justifiable only under conditions of low population density. And then his answer, which uh, has been uh, part of the thinking of commons for many decades thereafter, and is uh, um, concrete in some of our minds. What we need is mutual co mutual coercion, mutually agreed upon by the majority of the people affected. Next slide, Pete, please. Uh, number 19. Whether commons theory is the same as some other uh, elements of thinking of common pool resources is something that is addressed by people who have expertise beyond mine. But when I've been writing about uh, the Arctic without a specific interest in the commons 
I have attempted to understand uh, how theorists have addressed this. And this slide points out uh, that uh, game theory is a heuristic that has been applied to thinking of the, com uh, of the Arctic. From this perspective, the Arctic region holds possibilities of huge strategic, economic, and geopolitical gains. And there may be a race, for example, among Canada, the US, Russia, Norway, and Denmark, as their claims for the Arctic could overlap. Coupled with gaps in international law, gaps in governance, in this understanding, there is the potential of what game theorists call a zero-sum game. Every state plays for itself. But it also, this theory, theoretical perspective, also recognizes the possibility of cooperation among the rim states of the Arctic, creating a win-win outcome. Uh, these theorists point out that the game becomes complicated further as new actors seek to play. Here, the rim states face a situation of competition with newcomers. Newcomers. Next slide, Pete, please. Number uh, number nineteen. It could be that the rim states cooperate to contain the newcomers. It could be that some rim states allow the newcomers to enter the game and cooperate with them, defecting in the view of the other rim states using the language of game theory. And thirdly, some of these states act independently, or they all act for themselves. So there are a number of different possibilities. The least optimistic is that there is a zero-sum game. Next slide, 21. States may be talking cooperation, but preparing for conflict and using the Arctic to take uh, for themselves as in a commons. Next slide. Uh, before we move to the next slide, which is 21, uh, the, when we talk about players other than the rim states, we are talking about a large number of nation states in the international community that have strong interests in the Arctic in ways that we'll see in the slides following uh, that are both taking out of the commons and putting into the commons in ways that may be detrimental to the common. Next slide is 22. When we're so keeping with common thinking, if we're not thinking about management of a common, if we're thinking if nation states are acting in ways that maximize their individual gain, uh, what are the effects of that? There are many. Ecosystems of biodiversity degradation, over-harvesting of resources of the commons, of the Arctic in our case, and environmental stresses of several kinds. Next slide. Number 23, uh, concerns that we who study the Arctic have had independent, again, of whether the results of the way to address them is through common thinking, threats about invasive species. And that's a picture of the red king crab that has moved its way into uh, the Arctic. Uh, very serious concerns about temperature rises in the Arctic region. Atmospheric pollution uh, that affects the region as it affects the whole world. Inputs into the commons 
that pollute the commons through land-based industrial and municipal waste activities. Ice melt in the Arctic. Cultural change in the Arctic. These are among the concerns we have. The threat to the Arctic does the common thinking help us to improve our governance of the Arctic. Number 24, a threat to the Arctic that can be understood in common terms, something that in the last few years has been dramatically demonstrated through movies and uh, videos, through, through television specials, the Arctic now polluted by plastic, uh, happily not uh, as serious in all regions of the Arctic, but widespread in Greenland and the Barents Seas, uh, where there are high concentrations, hundreds of thousands of pieces per square kilometer. The Arctic is an important sink for plastic debris. Uh, in fact, as a side note, just as the polar bear has been the poster child for concern about the Arctic, it may well be like that the next slide, 25, that plastics become the poster child of the Arctic degradation. Uh, the surprise and chagrin that comes with seeing uh, plastics in these pristine, beautiful, what we thought untouched areas. Next slide is number 26. Other elements of what may be commons relevant threat. Climate change worldwide, climate change in the Arctic, drilling, uh, oil and gas resources in the Arctic have been, having been identified by uh, the U.S. government several years ago as extraordinarily plentiful uh, and um, of, of great value uh, under certain conditions. Fishing in the Arctic, the threats to the Arctic of overfishing, again, not realized yet, uh, but of a sufficient concern that that entered into a 16-year agreement uh, to preclude commercial fishing in the Central Arctic uh, and do studies as to the potential impacts if there were to be fishing. Another commons relevant effect or threat is uh, recreational, the growth in cruise tourism. Uh, right now, probably of, uh, not many of us have had the experience, but increasingly as in the other pole, the South Pole, uh, the experience is becoming available to larger numbers of people. And repeating a very important part of the threat that is perhaps the most concrete, dramatic uh, uh, way of understanding a commons and a threat to it, municipal, industrial, and agricultural waste and runoff into the Arctic. So, next slide, 27. The Arctic can be seen in terms of common and both taking out of the common, such as fish and other resources, and putting into the commons, the next slide, such as industrial pollution, slide 28. 
slide 29. That being the background and our understanding of what the common uh, uh, might look like, what are the implications of being the Arctic as the common? How would we manage it? Who is to management, manage it? And whether it is possible to meet principles for a well-managed common in the Arctic as they have been met elsewhere. And that's the next slide, number 30, the groundbreaking uh, Nobel Prize winning work of Eleanor Ostrom, principles for managing sustainably and equitably a commons resource. Here's what she um, put together based on her understanding and study of commons throughout the world. And I point this out not to say that I've concluded uh, or I've seen concluded in, uh, in other analyses uh, the degree of compatibility of the Arctic situation with these principles, but as a matter for us all to think about in, in the few minutes we have later for discussion. Is it an area number one where the group I define? Uh, what is the Arctic? Who is an Arctic state? Are we talking only about states or about other entities like indigenous people? Number two, things work well in commons management if we are able to match rules governing use of common goods to local needs and conditions. Those vary immensely, and it's a major challenge to learn what are local needs and conditions. Number three, ensure that those affected by the rules can participate in modifying the rules. Well, uh, in a still state-driven world, uh, nation states still being the major actors in uh, international environmental law and governance. Uh, how about those that are directly affected by governance choices uh, but are not members of nation states? Number four, making sure the rule making rights of community members are respected. Uh, by outside uh, authority. Uh, what does that mean in the context of the Arctic? Are outside authorities China, India, the European Union, or are they inside authorities? Five, develop a decision, a system carried out by community members for monitoring members' behavior. Important element, according to Professor Ostrom, and this is a challenge in the context of the vastness, the remoteness, and the inhospitable nature of much of the region. Use graduated sanctions for rule violators, another of her principle for managing the common. Uh, that is, of course, a major challenge in international law generally. Number seven, provide accessible low-cost means for dispute resolution. Is that predictable within the Arctic context? There are means that exist, the law of the sea tribunal, arbitration, and others, whether they are accessible to some, with the they are low cost is the question. Uh, build responsibly responsibility for governing the commons resource in nested tiers from the lowest level up to the entire interconnected system. And that conceptually makes sense to all of us. It's advisable, but it is a major challenge. Next slide. Happily, there are there is a 
plethora of good thinking about what we need to do to improve environmental go governance of the Arctic. Uh, people love the Arctic. People care deeply about it. Uh, people in their own institutions, in their writings, in their political work are constantly looking to ways to improve environmental governance of the Arctic. Next slide. And in fact, much has been done that could fall within Professor Hardin's notion mutually agreed upon mutual coercion. There are many treaties that address governance, environmental governance of the Arctic. Perhaps the most significant being what we call the Constitution for the Oceans, the Law of the Sea Treaty. Uh, as the slide notes, uh, 32, there are many different uh, bilateral and regional treaties. There's soft law, uh, the, uh, the uh, ideas expressed in meetings in the United Nations uh, uh, in a um, advisory way. There are hundreds of national laws aimed at protecting the Arctic environmental quality. There are the regional seas. There's the regional seas program, not a fully developed one in the Arctic, but uh, one that might uh, might come into being. Next slide shows how. So, so Joe, this is Carly. Sorry to interrupt. Sorry to interrupt yeah. you. Um, I just want to do a time check. It's about 5:37 my time, 37 minutes into it, and you're talking about important things as you're uh, on these slides. So. You make the call. Um, we've got about seven minutes left. Um, so you make the call when you want to stop and get Q&A, OK? Will do. Thank you. So the cons uh, I will continue on slide 33, the Constitution uh, zoning uh, the oceans, including the, uh, the uh, Arctic. And that is, in some ways, the reason why uh, some scholars and, uh, and, and, and politicians say, no, the Arctic is not a continent. It is zoned. We control it. We five literal Arctic states control it. The eight Arctic a member, the members of the Arctic Council uh, manage it. It is not a common. Uh, again, an area for discussion. Slide 34, just pointing out that there are, there's a vast inventory of other laws, mutual coercion, mutually agreed upon from specific species oriented like the polar bears uh, to um, more general uh, uh, treaties. Uh, uh, the, the, the note there says hundreds of treaties, and that may seem like an exaggeration, uh, but that's actually our hundred standing verbal agreements uh, within uh, the Arctic community on ways to protect the Arctic. Next slide, 35, thinking of uh, new approaches, more approaches to governing the environment of the Arctic more successfully, we have some favorable conditions uh, for that. Uh, there is increasingly um, good knowledge about the environment of the Arctic, although not complete, of course. Uh, the Arctic states, not all of them, uh, have many good resources, both uh, economic and intellectual uh, human uh, human resources. Uh, number three, there is a political will among many observers of the Arctic to keep it as clean, as pristine, as special as uh, we all want it to be. And finally, a favorable condition is that the world is now watching and wondering 
what will happen to this magnificent region. Number 36, this is a little um, advertisement. Uh, my pres our president work at the University of California, Irvine, is uh, undertaking a study of uh, uh, decision makers, policy leaders, uh, scientists, uh, indigenous people's views of what additional uh, governance entities we need uh, for protection of the environment of the Arctic. And this is a survey that we're undertaking uh, through the university, um, asking uh, whether or not the uh, respondent thinks that the Arctic is being managed from an environmental point of view acceptably, and if not, what are his or her suggestions about improvement. And on that slide, if you're interested, is uh, my uh, colleague and assistant, Dr. Olander, who would be happy to sign you up to fill in this 10-minute survey on whether additional instruments are needed for environmental governance of the Arctic. Uh, number 37, and now I'll start to close out so we can chat uh, for a bit. Uh, uh, a recent phenomenon has been mutual coercion, maybe not so mutually agreed upon through um, the use of adversarial approaches, uh, slide 37, to address environmental governance of the Arctic, and we could talk about that. In the discussion, slide 38, these adversarial approaches are aimed at having zero emissions of greenhouse gases into the, uh, uh, into the atmosphere, including the Arctic, keeping the coal in the ground and keeping in, uh, uh, with regard to the Arctic, uh, uh, fossil fuels in the ground. Uh, slide 39, these are uh, the approaches that are used to do lawsuits and petitions to international organizations, uh, who is the defendant, who is being challenged through these legal strategies, and you see those on slide 39. Slide 40 is a, a movement that has been uh, receiving considerable international attention, the Children's Trust. Seeing uh, the art, uh, seeing uh, the atmosphere as something that uh, national governments hold in trust for future generations, and that it cannot be alienated by um, uh, activities that uh, make available the commons to individual profit-oriented activities. Slide 41 gives you a little more. Uh, detail about the Children's Trust. I'm closing it out now, so I'll just ask you, should you wish to, to look at that later. Slide 42, uh, is the air, should it be seen as a public trust within this approach to uh, increasing governance of the, um, of the Arctic? Slide 43, some of the reasons why uh, some in the international community say we cannot wait for the slow processes of cooperation with nation states deciding to mutually coerce themselves, that coercion may well have to come uh, through individual actions of non-governmental organizations, specific nation states, indigenous peoples. Uh, the, uh, with the kinds of changes that are happening in the Arctic. Uh, number 44, for your interest, it's not just a U.S. phenomenon. These legal actions are being undertaken all over the world. Slide 45, including at the international level, including being brought by uh, Inuit people and the S ask Baskin peoples to various commissions of the international community. So the final slide, and uh, I happily can stop now. Um,
does Commons analysis apply to the Arctic? Uh, does it add value to our understanding of what needs to be done to improve the uh, environment of this great region? Uh, where does it lead in the international community to initiatives to be taken? Uh, and who are the we who use common thinking to improve conditions uh, in the Arctic? I thank you for this opportunity to chat with you. So, Joe, uh, because the other attendees uh, are muted, I'm going to clap for the attendees on behalf. Um, so I, I hope you heard my clapping on behalf of everybody that's listened. Um, I, I, uh, we've gone a little long. Um, I didn't want to stop or interrupt you, Joe, because you, the slides, while well, they were all interesting, um, the, the slides at the end um, were getting at um, issues of how to deal with some of the challenges. And so that's why I didn't stop. Um, uh, we're going to have to go pretty quickly, but as they're, uh, I'm looking at the Q&A, um, and if there's uh, other attendees, now's your time if you want to ask a question. I'm just going to pick one. Um, so here's a question. If the Arctic is a commons, does that suggest then that other regions or biomes may also be considered a commons? Uh, I can answer that quickly, yes. Uh, the common thinking has been uh, addressed in many areas of natural resource management, uh, uh, other, other great seas, other resources. So the short answer is yes, and that's part of the existence of common thinking is uh, application to many areas of natural resource management and environmental protection. Very good. Very good. So I'm going to, here's another uh, question quickly, Joe. Has game theory predicted state behavior that explains their behavior over the last 20 or so years? Uh, do you have a sense of that? Um, earlier in your talk, you talked about game theory as a possible useful tool. Um, has, has it, do you have a sense as to whether it's helped predict the behavior that's gone on? Um, in recent years? It's a great question, and it's a question for my colleagues across the campus. Uh, I think that they would conclude that uh, on balance, it has had considerable predictive power, probably with some major exceptions, uh, that it is a good heuristic for helping uh, policymakers to make decisions uh, in the international community. I'm not an expert in it, but uh, and uh, I've tried to learn about it for this Arctic work, and I think it has had a, a fairly decent um, record. Well, uh, um, oh, the last thing I wanted to ask you, I'm going to have to wrap up because we have another uh, webinar starting in about 10 minutes. Um, but, uh, Joe, for people that um, maybe didn't get a chance to ask, ask the question, do I have your permission to share your email address with the chat um, function of the system so somebody could email you if they have further questions? Of course. Okay. So I just hit enter. Um, attendees, if you're interested in um, talking to Joe directly, uh, his email is in the chat box. Uh, so at this point, I'm going to um, unfortunately have to close. Uh, Joe, this was a, a terrifically interesting um, uh, talk. Uh, I, I, you know, you, you had said at one point people care about the Arctic. I certainly feel that way, but I, I don't know much about it. Um, and so I really greatly appreciated your your, your overview slides and, and the more details of what's been happening. Um, so on behalf of the International Association for the Study of the Commons and all of the World Commons Week organizers, I'd like to thank all the attendees that attended. Um, uh, I don't know if we had anybody at the noon hour in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, but 
um, uh, wherever you are in the time zones right now. And, and Joe, thank you again for, uh, you know, all your hard work putting this together, for working with us to make it happen, um, and, and really giving a really great webinar and your permission to re record it and put it up um, afterwards for others to see. Um, in closing, I'd just like to remind people of two upcoming events, um, IAC, IASC events. Uh, in November, about a month from now, IASC is holding its first virtual conference put on by Marco Johansson at uh, the Arizona State University. Um, that, I think they still have a call for participation, so there's still time for that. And a little further, uh, in July 2019, IASC is holding their biannual uh, in-person conference in Lima, Peru. And the deadline for paper abstracts is now, um, it's been uh, extended to November 15th. So uh, I, I know the last time it was at the IASC conference in Utrecht two years ago, there was an Arctic uh, uh, group. I hope we have another Arctic group in the Peru conference. So again, thank you on behalf of IASC and the World Commons Week organizers. Um, uh, we appreciate everyone for attending and Joe for your hard work. At this point, I'm going to close thank the meeting. You. Thank you and congratulations on pulling off such an ambitious, difficult uh, task. It's wonderful. Take care. Well, thank, thank you, Joe. We have three more to do, but I think we're going to do it. <laughs> Cheers.